This time we welcomed Valt Snedots, who is partner at Sorinan Law Office in Latvia. He is co-head of Dispute Resolution and Risk Management team. He is one of the few practitioners on maritime and transportation law in Latvia's market. Hi, Valt. Hi, and uh, thanks for having, having me over. It's a pleasure to return to my alma mater. I have spent some time here at the Agricel, so it's glad to be back. Wonderful. Do you have a question to ask, Christopher? How was your day? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, as we just discussed, uh, my kid got sick, and uh, it just happens now and then. And then you just have to reschedule the whole agenda that you had, the whole plans that you had for today, just poof, gone. And, um, and that's life. And uh, I mean, uh, yeah. being a parent, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing role with, uh, with a lot of... Um, a lot of, I don't know, of everything. Mm -hmm. It gives meaning probably to the, to the things that you do daily, right? Yeah, sure. It's always about perspective. Uh, sometimes you think about uh, how important you are about what you do, about the case you're handling, and how important is your case or your client. But then uh, it comes, uh, it's about perspective. And uh, I mean, I mean um, about what doctors do or sometimes what, what I don't know. whoever does I mean it's always about perspective yeah and I think uh, from my perspective I, I would say that immediately it shifts the priorities of what you do you have a child sick of course it becomes your priority and you reschedule the hierarchy of your priorities at that point and try to fit everything you wanted to do and then you shift something to the ne next day and um yeah, and after like, next, and after next, and yeah. sometimes you just strike it off uh, from your agenda. I mean, sometimes, I, I noticed it last year, there were so many unnecessary calls going on about different topics. But I mean, people were frustrated, I, I think, back then, and, and they just wanted some, you know, the feeling that something is under control, because um, when the COVID started uh, last April or, or something in, in Latvia, I mean, people froze and then there was those calls were happening about nothing basically so yeah. that to have some sort of like a feeling that you control something yes. uh, but uh, they were quite annoying I must say but but then mm -hmm. when you strike half of them off I mean it's already better but I think uh, being a lawyer probably it's very important to be a good scheduling master so how do you understand what kind of uh, plans what kind of events or what kind of calls are necessary and what, which of them you can strike really off, or perhaps you can do it uh, in another form. You know, I, I like the saying, uh, or, or is it a joke, that uh, this should have been an email rather than a one-hour meeting uh, with you know, seven or more people involved. And an email, um, probably, and a message. Or, or a message. <laughs> when I was coming uh, here, I thought that uh, years ago we used Skype for short messages. But before that, we, we didn't use anything. It was just email when you also exchanged short messages. But now we have Microsoft Teams. I mean, I can't imagine my life without Microsoft Teams anymore. Not, not talking about the uh, video conferencing uh, possibilities, but just to, to exchange short, short, short messages. And, um, and then, yeah, you just start thinking about why is this meeting necessary? Uh, what are you about to discuss in this call? Uh, who, who must participate, to whom it's uh, not mandatory, and so on. And then you just start thinking. And it helps a lot uh, to, to form your day, basically, to schedule everything. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, my question was uh, whether clients prefer to have uh, uh, on-site meetings better, or they, there are like differences. Some of them prefer email mm. kind of communication. What is in your um, time of uh, professional experience, what is the typical thing for a client to do, to choose? All right, it's a bit a different, different angle uh, yeah. that you took. Um, all the clients need attention. And uh, the best you can do as a lawyer is to show your client that you care about it, uh, that you care about every existing client as a new client. Because when you have a new client, of course, you're overexcited about new case, new client. You want to show your best, but then you forget about, about the existing clients. And, and it's, of course, easy to say, but uh, always treat your, your existing client as new. And, of course, give attention. 
when you give attention proactively to the client about the case you're handling, uh, it's a good feeling. Um, you, can, you can judge by yourselves. If you are the service receiver and you receive a lot of attention from the service provider, it's, of course, uh, nice. It's, it's excellent. It's, you feel that your, your case is in good hands, and that's it. I mean, that's, that's the, the most important. Um, but um, about the way how you show the attention to the client, of course, uh, of course, uh, on-site meetings to, from time to time, yes, I prefer them as well. And uh, especially with new clients, um, uh, you know, it's, there's a, a thing called roadshows, which means uh, that, uh, for example, from Latvia, you go to the UK, to London, to meet uh, lawyers practicing there. Someone from Malta comes here uh, to Latvia to meet up lawyers just to discuss business and life. And, and sometimes during these COVID times, we had, uh, we had switched to online meetings. It's totally different. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not the same when you meet someone in person. Um, of course, now you can't, you have these travel restrictions, but still, I would prefer on-site meeting in person, the old style shaking hands and uh, perhaps going for lunch or, or, or dinner maybe, or, or just grab a beer with a client. I mean, it's, yeah. But currently, I mean, um, yeah, just picking up your phone and uh, finding a contact with you hum, with whom you haven't had the contact for some time and just making a call, it's already something. But do we do that? No. <laughs> not really. No, I mean, not that often as we would need to, to show, show our clients that we care. But, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I have to work on my, on my planning skills. That's, that's for sure. From what you said, I really hear that law and diplomacy go hand in hand, right? Even if not practicing in, uh, like, international arena. I mean, social skills yeah, is always a part of the work. And upkeeping some connections. It's so important. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge topic of um, how do you choose a lawyer? and what are the qualities uh, by whom you choose a lawyer. Is it the university diploma, the average grade, or what is it, recommendation, or uh, you just switch on TV and there he or she is, and that's how you choose a lawyer. I mean, um, we, we can discuss that <laughs> as well, but uh, yeah, sure, these, these social skills are very important. Yeah, of course. Now I've been wondering how I was chosen. <laughs> For the law firm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can tell you that, yeah, of <laughs> course. But um, what I wanted to say is that um, um, is that um, it's the people uh, who make the bond. It's about it's about people. It's not about law, your uh, diploma or your firm name or or anything. It's first of all the person whom you're dealing with, and he or she might be the brightest attorney in Latvia. But I wouldn't hire him or her if uh, she would just. He, he, he or she wouldn't blend in the team or because of the, of the social skills lacking, something like that. Yeah, so social skills, project management, they're all, all part of the person you choose, even though the skills uh, are so good, if the person does not fit. It's not a team player or something. Yeah, well, project management that you mentioned, I mean, we're struggling with that as well. Of course, you have to be efficient in project management, uh, handling um, uh, many cases simultaneously, uh, different projects, uh, part of many teams. And um, in our firm, we also have uh, a lot of trainings, also including project management. But somehow, I mean, it's not improving or it's not improving enough. Project management is something, I mean, we can just talk and talk about that, and, uh, but um, well, people are, are quite mm -hmm. stubborn. I mean, if they're really not forced to like, manage a project properly, and um, unless they do not fuck up something, then, then, then they start probably thinking about, uh, about their project management skills. But otherwise, I mean, trainings and trainings and trainings, so many trainings we're having. What I uh, thought about is that uh, Project management really is an issue that, that never ends because of the fact that we see all the time people still talking about how to manage your time, productivity. Uh, new methods of, of project management are being developed and implemented, such as Agile, for example, right? Uh, especially in, in kind of uh, pro software development spheres, and but also in business development. And, 
and it's interesting, but it's just a never-ending story, really. I mean, at some point when I as uh, I experienced the COVID situation, um, I saw how I shifted from wo- working, you know, f- studying at school, then going to work. I had to be on one in one place at one time, and I had to concentrate only at one thing. Then it's totally different. But then COVID came. And it felt like you have the ability, the possibility to be in many places at one time. Sometimes I even switched both of my computers and I was in two places at the same time. And I realized, but I'm not concentrating on what I do 100 percently because now I have the opportunity to be everywhere in every part of the world at the same time. And it kicked me. And um, since then, I'm trying to manage myself uh, to concentrate on one thing because then I didn't do not gain everything I can from this particular meeting there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can relate. I mean, if we talk about multitasking in, in, in that sense, I'm, I'm really bad at multitasking. Um, I, I always talk about myself that I have one channel, one incoming, one outgoing, and I, I can't like, you know, watch uh, two screens at the same time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would lose one screen at one moment totally and or or even worse i would get 50 percent of each so this means that i wouldn't get one Likewise. of them properly yeah. in whole um i can't even normally like you know people like to, to 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 listen songs or podcasts even or probably your podcast while walking i i mean i would never do that i prefer just just being alone in my thoughts and just uh, you know I like walking and, and, and thinking about my, my day, about reflecting about previous days and about what I'm g- about to do in this particular day. It, for me, it's like um, to get me set myself in, in shape and form for, for the working day. So multitasking now, but you mean, I mean, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with this, um, with new technologies you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more and more possible that you are becoming more effective in, in doing multiple projects at the same time. Yeah, sure. Or, or you don't have to travel. You, you yeah. can work from home. You, you spend uh, those hours. Uh, you would have spent traveling uh, uh, for work, for projects that you do. What do you uh, focus on more now, given the importance of online meetings in international dispute uh, resolution, for example, when you meet perhaps clients from, uh, from other kind of really regions and, and they have their own time zones, they're perhaps tired, Perhaps they have their own kind of mentality. So, and given all this online environment, perhaps is has the communication changed also with with kind of uh, in this kind of a more professional environment, not client to client, but more of a you know representation. Um, I wouldn't say that it has changed much. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps last year, because last year was was the year of challenges. People need to to, to shift and. Um, uh, it was a strange time last year, but now people are are generally adjusted due to the to technology, to online communication in general. Um, even the older generation, for example, or, or people who rarely communicate over uh, over uh, yeah on 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 online calls or or Skype or Microsoft Teams or anything. Uh, there is this shift that we see and currently I mean people have adjusted I, I don't see a huge problem with with different time zones or our mentalities let's shake up a bit uh, how, <laughs> do you, uh, how do you explain your job uh, to children because mm. I think you know when you say I'm a president some somebody has some kind of an un- notion of, of what that this might be or I'm a medic for example right mm. but but lawyers it's a quite a complicated kind of a profession that you understand only with time so how do you explain that mm. yeah I, I have gone through this exercise not at home but we had a professional training when we had to it was about uh, the training in in, in 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 one minute it was more about how we advertise ourselves you know, there are special rules for law firm advertising, and uh, they're more conservative, to say at, at least. And, um, and um, yeah, if you can't define your project or, or who you are or what you do in simple words, then, then how can you advertise yourself? So I, I remember back then that I was uh, trying to explain more um, my profession more from the medic's perspective, like that we are uh, people curing something 
looking for cure or, or for the right medicine uh, to get away from a problem, which is some sort of an illness or, or, or an ache or something like that. Um, if you ask me now, I would, I would shift to explanation of one of my colleagues that we are rather probably sort of a teachers, more educating people about, um, about law, their rights, obligations, how to live in society, how to do it properly. Um, yeah, and I, I like this uh, explanation that it's more about uh, educating people. But wouldn't you say that it involves more listening rather than, you know, kind of lecturing because of the fact that you need to be good at interpersonal skills and understand what are the needs of your client or the other side? And, and, and yes. So what's the balance there? Absolutely, it's about understanding, and then you can give the right medicine mm -hmm. or the right, right rector, lecture or, or advice. Um, and of course, it's, it's understanding. Uh, how you understand, of course, is listening and also asking proper questions. Yeah, it's, it's an art of, of, of listening and, 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 and questioning. And, and we have this, uh, this uh, helping clients succeed uh, philosophy in our firm that uh, what we are trying to do is, um, first of all, the purpose to, is to help the client to succeed in, in their business. And how, we do, how, how do we do that? And, and we think that uh, we can provide the exact solution to the client's problem, and that makes us better than the competitors. So how do we find the exact solution to the problem is understanding what the problem is. And of course, how do you understand the problem is, is you listen and ask. And it's as simple as that, but uh, <laughs> it's much different in practice, of course. Yeah, but, yeah. it reminds me of uh, asking the right questions first. Then I had uh, this course in legal writing uh, last month, and I realized how important it is. Even if it's the most complicated case, uh, and you have to find the, the solution, it may be very complicated and hard, but for the client, you have to explain it in the easiest way possible because the client has no idea maybe of, of the legal system. And I realized, huh, so super hard, but you have to explain to the client as if it was your child. Mm -hmm. So the child understands what are you talking about. And that's what clients probably buy, right? Uh, your, your explanation in a really understandable way. Yes, there, there are several angles ab uh, about uh, this topic. Uh, one is uh, that sometimes, well, let's start with that, that um, normally clients uh, are educated, of course, people uh, in business, they, 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 they think that they know what they want, and they, in, uh, they call you and they ask for a legal opinion on this topic, uh, or they ask for a contract, or, or they, they ask for things. They do not ask for a solution, they already provide a solution, that the contract is a solution to their problem. Or, um, I mean, a client ask, calls and asks, um, can you draft a sales contract? I mean, yeah, of course you understand what are the goods and, and price and everything, and you gather the information for the contract, but the first question is what are you about to do with that contract? Why do you need it? Is it probably uh, for the same group company, so you can draft it plain and simple? or without any, I mean, difficult uh, dispute resolution clauses and, I mean, contract, there are many types of contracts. That, and, or, or a client asks, uh, how you, can you draft this contract in English? A Latvian client, for example, asks, why, why do you need it in English? And, and uh, or it was vice versa. It was English client who asked for a contract in Latvian or a b bilingual, and we asked, why do you need it? I mean, uh, but uh, the, the contracting party is Latvian. So I understand that under Latvian law, you have to have all the contracts in Latvian. And we explained it's not exactly the case, so you actually don't need it. The client was happy because uh, he didn't have to pay for, for the contract in Latvian language. But uh, first comes the question, what are you about to do with it? Or not exactly the, this question, but you have to understand the purpose of, of what you're about to do. Or let's take litigation, why do you need to start a litigation? And you can't think of, of win-lose uh, when talking about litigation. There are many, many other aspects what you could try to achieve with a litigation, for example. Uh, so that was about, uh, I forgot the other angle uh, that we started. You, you, it was in your question. What was your question again? Uh, my question was, uh, <laughs> 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 oh, we were talking about uh, the, how comprehensive uh, some kind of an... Uh, answers to your client and, and the clients really uh, desire uh, simple kind of understandable solutions, right? 
Yes, yes, right, right. Um, about drafting memorandums that I wanted to touch upon. Yeah, uh, lawyers are good at writing, of course, lengthy papers and uh, um, not because we are paid by page. It's never like that. Uh, but somehow we think normally that writing more is more convincing and like and this means better and this means that we're about to, to succeed in the case mm -hmm. but i would say in court probably but when you when you write something to the client yes sometimes it requires a lot of writing but uh, if the question you can answer or with yes or no i always start the answer with yes or no and then i go because not the long story and then yes or no is somewhere in the middle but I always start with yes or no. And, and that's how you determine uh, a good lawyer uh, who can say, who can take the risk of saying yes or no. Because always the questions, the, the answers or, or uh, that we are, um, or the areas, it's, it's never black and white. It's always gray, 50 shades, if you want. Yeah, sure. But um, yeah, it's difficult to give a yes or no answer. It's, it's quite always difficult. Because these questions uh, that come from the clients, in, in quite many situations, the clients have their own in-house lawyer, which means that they have already uh, discussed this internally and they haven't come to an answer. Then they come to a law firm and then they need a yes or no answer. And they're not happy if you give, again, 50-50 chance. Yeah. You know. I mean, uh, what I don't like in, in, in those memos is there is a medium risk of what on earth <laughs> do you want to say with, with there is a medium risk <laughs> of something happening or not happening? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't give uh, anything. The client would call you back. Okay, so please explain once more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have gone through this. Yeah, of course. We all do. In law firms, I mean. Regarding teaching, um, so client communication is a bit of teaching, as you said. Um, how would you compare it to teaching at RGSL? Well, um, first of all, I would want to take this opportunity to say that it has been a great experience teaching here at the RGSL. Um, I started, uh, I don't remember when, but I started with comparative constitutional and administrative law. And I must admit it was a bit more than I could chew back then. Um, and actually the how the course was designed was probably not, not the right approach. Uh, I mean, it's just too difficult for people from spending to after 12 years at school to come and, and start uh, comparing constitutions of Poland, USA, and Saudi Arabia or anything. Or, and it's just the approach was probably not the best. But um, it was great. And uh, now uh, I'm giving few seminars, a few seminars a year on mostly private international law issues, Vienna Sales Convention and, and, uh, and uh, topics as, as those. And uh, I enjoy it because I can give some practical insights into application of laws into how this works in practice. Because I mean, if you ask me, I think, um, uh, well, I'm quite concerned about the quality of legal education in Latvia in general. And I think that the, um, the weakest point is, is people not uh, after graduation, they do not have any practice, any clue of how this works in practice. I mean, uh, when I graduated back in 2008, uh, I have never written a contract during my studies. How can I write a contract in my, uh, in my first job uh, that I haven't ever written a contract? Of course, I can put a contract together or, or, or um, from, from the articles of, of law or, or download somewhere from, from the internet, but it shouldn't be how it should work. I mean, you, you, you must have some, some sort of experience. And the same is about also about teaching, uh, teaching that you come to the seminars and explain how this Vienna Sales Convention article is applied, applied in practice and you study some case law. But you also discuss from the practical perspective, what is that evidence that you provide to the court to prove one or other position? So, uh, I mean, you, you must have a professor in the lectures and uh, a, a pr practitioner in the seminars. That's, that's my belief. Yeah, definitely. I can agree on that. 
I remember that I studied, I finished my bachelor's this year, and I had only one lecture when one, only one uh, person gave me an example how to write a memorandum, one in three years. And at that point, I realized when I entered uh, the law firm's doors that I have no experience in practical, like practic practical things, no mm. contracts, nothing. I agree totally. And uh, I wish I had that kind of experience because then it would be easier for both uh, my uh, uh, the person, my mentors, uh, other lawyers in the law firm, because they already would have expected more skills from me. But now they take more time to, you know, play with me, give me, you know, feedbacks yeah. and stuff. How, what should I improve? What yeah. shall I do better? And it's called investment. Yes, yeah. that's that's what we do in, with 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 young people, young colleagues. Um, mood courts is a good um, exercise to gain extra skills to test yourself and. Um, in different circumstances and under huge stress. Um, but it's, it's one thing, of course, and it's how you can get some experience. But for me, it's also equal if you have, uh, I mean, drafted a contract for your family business on, I don't know, sale of cup cupcakes or mm. a lease contract or anything. I mean, it's already something because as, as you say, yeah, people join law firms with very good academic background but then you have to understand how how this works what is that we provide to the client in what form uh, what is that they are paying for because of course they are paying for your time which is spent on providing uh, some sort of an, an, an input but uh, at the end it's uh, it's it's the input itself not the time that you have spent on it yeah definitely and I realized that uh, I I can say to myself that I did a great job understanding it after the first year and then I went on Erasmus. Uh, it's been the half of my studies. I realized, okay, I'm back in my country. I need practical experience. Because at that point I realized, okay, it's not coming to me. So I need to gain some perspective of how it works in the real life. And only then you realize it's nothing like actually working in, in, in academics, you know, coming to lectures and just hearing just the theoretical background of the stuff. So, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, and of course, uh, there are employers who, who require uh, experience, uh, but then you don't have it because <laughs> you, you just can't. And um, yeah, w what can I suggest? I mean, um, not nothing much, but uh, you Take can try. Take the internships, uh, maybe. Yeah, you can you can try internships, or you can try. There is this legal aid clinic. Uh, there was one. Probably there are more nowadays. Um, but there are many people uh, who need legal aid, um, and um, I mean, currently, I think there is one one day a year. Which is called I don't know what kind of days, lawyers' days. No, just figured Shadow it out. Shadow days? No, yeah. no, 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 it's different. It's one, right? Okay. Um, it's 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 one day uh, during uh, one day a year organized by the bar association okay. that um, attorneys are free up free to sign up to provide uh, legal advice for free for one day. Mm. So you you sign up for that, and then random people come and. Uh, I also sign up uh, at least once, and and yeah, and, and random people come up with with uh, huge problems, and they haven't solved them because they they don't have funds to solve the problems because attorneys normally are expensive, or the people think that attorneys are expensive. That's a different story, or they think that they're they have a huge problem, which actually is not huge. That's also uh, highly possible. Um, but yeah, there are quite a lot of people who need uh, legal assistance. It's interesting. You said about these legal clinics, and it goes back to what we were uh, talking about, you know, lawyers being kind of doctors. So yeah, these yeah. Perils are there. Mm -hmm. These perils are there. What I wanted to ask is, um, let's go even further back in, in the past. So how would you compare more generally your experience at, at the University of Latvia versus RGSO? So perhaps also the skills or the approaches and then how do you enjoy both? Hmm. 
I did enjoy both uh, in, in one way or another. Um, University of Latvia uh, offers the, the classic style approach, uh, very conservative um, education with highly skilled professors, very academic, um, I would say. Um, and it, it offers for sure very thorough studies. You study criminal law for, for uh, two semesters and then criminal procedure law I mean, you study for four lectures a week or something like that, and you you have to understand every article in the criminal law, how it operates, what what does it mean, uh, how the qualification differs. I mean, people who ha someone who has never like gone through this can't understand what does it mean, especially when back then in 2006 or or what was it there was uh, there wasn't enough legal literature on on quite many topics there were some outdated uh, law journals uh, that we had to copy uh, there was a printing room with those articles uh, printed and if you wanted that article you had to go and and, and copy it mm -hmm. and you had your your library card uh, prepaid for for copies uh, the PDFs didn't exist that you just could download or I don't know why but it, it was just the way it worked back then you had to copy <laughs> now I sound like I mean ancient <laughs> but uh, it was how it worked and it was very academic and I had to really to study and prepare myself for for every seminar because I knew if my if, if the professor would say my name I, I just need to know the answer because then I had to repeat to retake the, the, the seminar or, or whatever that was. It was very strict, very strict. But I'm very glad that I, um, I graduated uh, and uh, I have a good basis of, of what I have built now. So it was it was hard time. And the law exam, the university exam to, 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 uh, to get the lawyer's qualification, it was the second worst exam in my life. Uh, the Bar Association exam was the worst, but yeah. Someone who has never taken it, it just cannot relate. Mm -hmm. And now when we see, when there is one, one unified centralized uh, lawyer's exam and we see that only students from Latvian University pass it, well, isn't it strange? It shows, it shows right? Um, but okay, that's, that's a different stop topic about the quality of legal education in, in, in Latvia as a whole. But about the RGSL, um, I graduated from the master's program uh, from, from the Transborder Commercial Law Program. And I can say uh, that really after graduation, I really understood something about how Transborder Commercial Law operates. It was for the first time that I understood how Rome regulation, how the Rome regime or Brussels regime operates. Because at the University of Latvia, I just, I don't know, these, those, those names didn't tell me anything. I studied those subjects and sort of passed the exams, but I never understood how it works in practice or what does it actually mean or when to apply which and, and how they operate. Never. But then, with Professor Frank Diedrich, first of all, I mean, I, I, I understood those subjects. And then I realized that actually I'm probably the only one in my law firm who understands those subjects that well. So I sort of started specializing myself in, in private international law. Because nowadays, I mean, uh, barely any transaction happens within uh, the same country. Normally, the parties are from different countries, at mm -hmm. least, at least in our firm or the transactions that we work with. So there is always some sort of an international element present in a transaction or, or a contract or anything. So yeah, uh, RGSL, it was a great experience. Uh, it was a really great experience. I enjoyed it. Um, it was quite difficult. Um, I was working back then as well. So full-time job and, and, and RGSL. So it wasn't that easy at that time. But uh, it was worth it, certainly. Yeah. Now maybe uh, let's shift to the most wanted uh, questions of... Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> failures? <laughs> <laughs> So to say, uh, I don't know if it's uh, okay to say, you will cut it out <laughs> in case, fuck-ups. Um, so uh, ha do you remember maybe from your, I don't know, beginning of the days or 
even now as a professional where you think, ha, huh, it happened. How should I approach this? That is like this one, two examples that are ingrained in your memory so boldly that you have learned from that as well so much. And now you pay more attention or you're more careful. <clears throat> mm, yes. Um, if I think of fuck-ups, um, which is, of course, far more interesting than, than the success, success stories, then um, one, uh, there's one r remarkable moment uh, that I remember very vividly. Um, it is... When I when I was promoted to partnership in in, uh, in last January January 2020, and uh, of course uh, team's failure is my failure, so it doesn't it's not important whose failure it actually is. If we think it philosophically, it's, it's the whole firm's failure. But anyways, so it wasn't my failure, uh, but I mean it was the project I was supervising, so actually it was my failure. So I, I, I remember the day when I was promoted to partnership and I, I received flowers and, 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 and congratulations and, and everything. And I returned to my, my workplace and there was a letter from the Supreme Court on, 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 on my chair. And I opened it and it said that uh, our uh, cassation complaint has been uh, rejected. It was the Supreme Court uh, because we have missed the deadline. Mm -hmm. So my first job as a new partner was to inform the client that we have missed the deadline for the cassation complaint. And <coughs> and that was a very hilarious moment. These, uh, things, happen, that's, I think, these things happen, but I mean, how do you explain that to the client yeah. who has paid uh, this much for, for the cassation complaint and then and there's no no uh, no appeal. No, you, you just your case is dismissed. The the war is over. You you lost and um, yeah, and um, how but, did you feel? Um, <laughs> terrible, of course, but that was um, that was a great lesson. That you always have to think of not only about success but also about failures and how you. I mean, it's like birth and death; it always comes together. So you 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 must always understand or remember that you can fail or your team can fail and then you must uh, stand up and, and call the client to tell or to provide a solution. And I mean, we can always give a discount to an invoice or anything but uh, for bad advice or something like that. But in this type of situations, uh, there is no room. I mean, no appeal, nothing. You can't uh, write a new appeal or anything for free or, or remedy that. It just it is over. It's, it's stated in the letter. It's over. And um, we, uh, it, it ended good. Uh, we discussed with the client, and uh, it was actually at the end the client who told what the deadline was because it is calculated from the moment he received it. And uh, it was client's error, or at least the client uh, took it as, as his error. Anyways, it ended uh, good. We're in on good terms with, with the client. But uh, yeah, it was it was terrible. It could go the wrong way. Yeah, of course, we can be sued, yeah. or uh, we can somebody some, someone can be can, can can be held liable for for that mistake. Yes, and uh, yeah, I, I always keep that in mind. On a more perhaps positive aspect, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the successes and the, and the failures. Uh, but uh, really, uh, in, in your practice, has there been any kind of funny moments in, in, in courtrooms specifically because I probably on paper it's quite uh, not that um, well not that fruitful. readable yeah it's right. not that mm -hmm. fruitful the, f the jokes and the this kind of uh, the small fuck ups don't really uh, show there but in the courtroom perhaps no? and nothing I can come up with at the moment how about perhaps um, I don't know working with clients perhaps some some interesting personalities that you have. Oh yeah. For example, I would say I would say that definitely even every judge has its own personality and mood. It also impacts the case uh, or the court or the court hearing or. Is other kind of different ways how you try to speak, uh, knowing. Prepare yourself for going to the court. You know which person is going to be in front of you. Hmm. 
Yes, uh, I can come up with, with two examples uh, or, or two type of um, yeah clients and and one one, one clients one one courtroom let's say so. Um, so the courtroom first probably. Um, so it's first of all it's fun thing how attorneys behave at court um, in comparison with how they behave outside the courtroom. So you can be very friendly outside the courtroom, but then when you enter the courtroom. It's completely different, and sometimes, I must admit, it's sometimes, uh, I mean, uh, too unprofessional, uh, in, in my view. Uh, when it's close to assault, uh, sometimes people really turn very rude uh, in the courtroom, not controlling their emotions, also professionals. And uh, and sometimes you, the worst thing is, is you can take it personally, or, um, I remember when I just started to practice and I was representing a client in the court and we had uh, a nice chat with, uh, with the respondent's attorney, uh, much experienced back, the, back then than me, and uh, we discussed about the case and the settlement and we are like, okay, the, uh, the hearing starts. And he was very loud and started uh, accusing me of, of uh, falsifying documents and of uh, initiating criminal proceedings about against me and, and stuff like that. And I was like, what the yeah, yeah, we were just, yeah. uh, I just didn't see that coming at all. And uh, of course, that's a lesson that I took uh, back then that uh, you must always be prepared for anything that comes. And we won the case after all, so the judge wasn't impressed about this theater, I would, I would say. But yeah, people tend to be quite, quite uh, different. Or uh, back when I was in-house lawyer, I represented my, my company at court, and then uh, there was a state revenue service representative who, three of them, uh, who were very, very uh, cheerful and uh, making jokes outside the courtroom. And then uh, when we, when, when we uh, entered the courtroom, <coughs> and I was giving explanations, and then it was uh, the respondent's turn to give explanations to state revenue service. So one, uh, one guy, the most bold one, stood up and, and um, he was uh, stuttering. He, he, he couldn't even speak in front of the judge. He was so nervous. Absolutely. It didn't destroy their case, unfortunately. But uh, it also was quite quite funny to see. I mean, that, yeah, <laughs> people are so different inside and outside the courtroom in front of a judge or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's quite a respect that uh, yeah, you're talking to a judge. I mean, it's, yeah. And uh, another example that I can think of is, is not a client. Uh, well, it's, it's more a law firm than a client, but this law firm is our client from one of the neighboring countries. Um, very demanding. With, with demanding, I mean, um, if, if he or she, okay, it's he, calls you and you don't pick up, then uh, he would write an email immediately. If you don't call back in 15 minutes, there would be an email would, would call him back. And this client was very, very sharp uh, with, with like deadlines for, for half an hour or something like that. He, here's the task, you have 30 minutes to come up with, uh, with at least an answer, with an indicative answer or anything, but you have like, and they were working like that all the time. We had this project for more than six months. And all the time it was like, you see him calling, it's already a frustration. I mean, you have to put everything away, and you know that you will have 30 minutes to provide an answer to some specific question. Um, and, and then I realized, yeah, how it's, uh, what kind of business they do, um, and, and how they operate. And uh, also, of course, how small Latvian businesses. I mean, the economies of, of uh, three Baltic states combined is half of Finland. It's, it's nothing. I mean, we, we operate in such a tiny market with such tiny and cases and, and, and uh, tiny clients. Uh, so unfortunately, yeah, there's not that much business. You have um, illustrated in this uh, talk really high stake situations. And also, putting alongside uh, that you are a parent, how do you decompress? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time with my family. That's mm -hmm. true. That's true. And um, sometimes uh, dealing with with the kids uh, is easier than with colleagues. 
I can imagine <laughs> because it, because of the relationship is so you know kind of uh, long lasting perhaps. Yeah, you know, sometimes there is more drama at work than uh, than <laughs> with with a two year old toddler. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes it's vice versa, yeah, but uh, for me, family is very important, of course, um, and as I try to spend as much time as I can with my kids. Um, I, I go to the gym from time to time uh, or, or um, watch a movie or something, or, or I, I study Spanish. Cool. That's, that's what I do at, in my free time, and uh, this is something for m myself. Then I, I try to go to Spain for practice. Uh, once a year, I didn't go last year because of COVID, but still, and this is time for myself. Then you know, it's I can I can I can go wherever I want and and and, and practice speaking on on the street or whatever. Uh, yeah. What kind of food do you like? Sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Spit it out. Like Spanish food, you know. Uh, Spanish food. Uh, mm, paella. Yeah. <laughs> paella. It's mm. very like touristic, I would say. Uh, I I normally don't prefer paella. No, no, no. I prefer, you know, Mediterranean s style style food or, or even more Italian. Yeah, I like Spanish people, not Italian people, but probably more Italian food <laughs> <laughs> than, than Spanish food. Uh, <laughs> okay, I see. I see that. Uh, but okay, you have vacation, for example. You sometimes, sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and still, do you take your laptop, mobile phone with you? Can you totally relax during your get vacations, or it's just like workation type of thing? Yeah, I I, I wanted to to mention this uh, when we talked about project management and and, and planning and everything. Um, yes, it's normally workation, but for me, I'm so used to that that. Uh, a vacation without my laptop would be a frustration uh, that I've <laughs> lost it somewhere or someone has stolen my laptop where is it I would constantly look for it you know, avoid right because some, something's not there right something is not there like, yeah like your your smartphone but uh, yeah of course now nowadays uh, all the email is in smartphone and uh, for me it's for me um, having this feeling of control is also important when it comes to, to checking emails, for example, or client communication, I I like the feeling that everything is is going smooth, that um, cases are taken care of, and and I, I like that feeling. And when I have that feeling, I have a good vacation, I have good rest, because otherwise I would be thinking, hmm, there was this deadline. Did they remember that we have to submit everything by that day? And of course, everything is always okay. But um, yeah, I like this feeling of security that uh, I have my laptop or I have my, my mobile phone. The only exception is, um, is, is normally when I go to ski. I snowboard actually myself, but we have this skiing, skiing trip tradition with my family. So then, yeah, it's, it's quite almost no time for, for, uh, for, uh, for key emails. And then I so, sort of uh, relax to that stage that I don't even look for it. Yeah, but otherwise, yeah, and that's and 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 I, I like this uh, this thing that, for example, I can show up at work at 10 p.m. 10 a.m. because I, I was to went to gym, and then work uh, at night or, or check email or whatever. Uh, I like this flexibility, so yeah. for me, it's uh, an advantage. I would say this workation is my advantage, to put it that way. Yeah, it's, yeah. Very, it's really important just to understand how you're working. Many people I, I see all around, they, they try to push for some kind of a regime or some kind of a way of working, but not really understanding, perhaps it's not for me. Perhaps I can work differently, but so innovating all the time, I think it's important. Well, I mean, the feeling maybe when you actually trust your uh, em employees exactly. enough that they will meet the deadline, they do their work, you don't have to have this strict you know, eight to five or... Exactly. Yes, Nine yes. It's, uh, it's about uh, team management or, yeah, team management. Uh, you have to be a leader for the team, not the manager, actually. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fear. It's the manager's fear of something not being done. And then he or she wants to see you in the office so that uh, he or she can control what time you leave the work or whatever. But it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you can get the work done anytime. You know, 
everything. All you need is mo mostly computer, uh, your laptop. So it's fair. Yeah, it's fair and it's understandable. And, and that's why we have these three plus two or whatever style <laughs> working weeks uh, because of fear. What would you wish uh, to the listeners of the podcast, perhaps students, perhaps lecturers also? So something uh, what you thought was interesting in this interview or would like to emphasize? The question is about this interview? Or just generally, I don't <laughs> know. Just uh, perhaps something that you've been thinking about lately or <coughs> think that would be interesting to share. Something life lesson that, maybe yeah or something that you just discovered you know all right all right uh yeah i, I haven't thought of that before um but i would say it very simple use critical thinking it's very important and it becomes more and more important from from one day to another we we can see it in the society in press I mean, all the vaccine situation, um, pros and cons, anti-vaxxers, or this um, the story with with uh, with the art uh, being discussed, that the art has to be normal. I mean, what does that mean? And and that you initiate criminal proceedings for a piece of art. I won't express my opinion here about that, but uh, yeah, use critical thinking, and then. And then also uh, use of police functions would be more rational. Uh, of course, um, oh, yeah, it's a huge topic, huge new, new topic to discuss. Uh, but uh, yeah, critical thinking is something that people are lacking. Also because of, of the huge amount of information that we have access, access to uh, on a daily basis about the, the huge amount of opinions on different topics by different kinds of people, including pop stars and, and, and politicians and everyone. Nowadays, everyone would, uh, everyone can give opinion in, in, in public, and, and people quote it. Um, so, use critical thinking. Indeed, is is the best I can come up come up with at the moment. Yeah, for sure. I I was wondering how it formed for me because when you are a child, you you're influenced by the way your parents think, what they say, how they look at life, and. At one point, you start to think on your own. You start to wonder, what is my opinion on this? But mm. sometimes <laughs> some people don't ask. They look what others say. But if they would ask themselves what I think about it, they wouldn't have an answer. My biggest fear, actually, is how, uh, how do I explain to my daughter what is true on the Internet and what is not? I, have, I haven't come up with an answer yet. And we haven't discussed such things, but I mean... There are so many border lines, border stories, uh, fakes, and and how how do you explain your child which is which is true and which is not? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I hope the listeners uh, to this podcast know uh, which is true and not on the internet. But uh, yeah, and don't disseminate fake information, please. But yeah, it's 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 difficult. Mm. Well, thank you for coming to the podcast. Thank well, you. thanks for inviting me. Yes, I, I think this was an insightful experience for our listeners because um, it's really interesting that uh, each guest that we have, even though many of them share the same profession, they have so diverse uh, opinions and perspectives on the same topics. I think that's why it's really nice to have a conversation. Thank yeah. You. Thanks once more.